to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh, yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily, there's more to you than you think. Jersey, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, we've already been having a great conversation. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we almost didn't finish. We oh, yeah. didn't, yeah. didn't we want already to did finish. a podcast. We didn't want to come right? here. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of things to talk about, but um, you know, let's talk about for the first first part. Let's talk about your history in Olympic weightlifting and uh, and and what you've learned from that journey that's that's a big part of your your life history you know this explanation uh, of that or and the history is always coming with a different way <laughs> mm. whenever i'm asked about that mm -hmm. i say it <laughs> yeah way. totally so i i i train in um olympic weightlifting uh in poland i was 13 when i started and when i was uh um uh, let's say I have to go to the time where I was 18, 19. I entered the fire department and then I was a fireman. Mm. So we talk about that. We'll talk about that more. Yeah, what it means to be. What uh, it means to be a hero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or to be a fireman, right? Yeah. <laughs> or a policeman <laughs> like your dad. Yeah. And really love Olympic weightlifting. So it's it's uh, something that um, challenged me and and gave me possibility to uh, train myself. Mm -hmm. I was one-on-one -on -one with it, like one-on-one uh, -on -one with numbers. Numbers, weightlifting is just numbers. It's like you fight numbers. Mm. You fight 215 or 227, <laughs> you, you fight numbers. Constantly you fight numbers. And then it's, uh, uh, the other aspect of it is the is the mind and micro progression, and then you uh, train that nervous system to lift more and overcome more weight, and match the dead weight. You know, every time when you go to unknown, and unknown is that place where uh, you didn't lift certain weight before, and then you will lift for the first time. It's completely unknown. You mm. never know where the bar is going to end above your head, whether mm -hmm. it will loop and will go backward or front or you actually make it, mm -hmm. always unknown. And uh, so what, what it's done in weightlifting is every time you have this accumulation of repetitions, numbers, and then you will have all the lifts that must, must match before you actually attack the weight. So everything has to work before. Mm. All the numbers have to work. So the, you, it, the sounds like, number. it sounds like you you had a pretty meticulous plan. Right. You know, like a very careful plan. You talked about micro progressions. Exactly. And it's probably why Tim Ferriss liked, you know, getting coached by you so much because he's very much of a numbers, very meticulous with his, the way that he approaches his training. You know, oh yeah, he, uh, yeah. He loves numbers, definitely, yeah. <laughs> and but, uh, not only numbers. He loves uh, uh, data. He loves uh, yeah. uh, his journal. He loves to uh, know what he's doing, and and he loves to progress in life. Right. So that's probably the most important. He loves the results. He loves the goals, but he loves the results, and he wants to deliver something. Mm. So. In order to deliver, you, you have to be in a process of uh, microprogression. It means process, microprogression and process and progress. Mm. So when uh, when I coached him, he was always with his journal, mm. and he was always this uh, scribbling something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we were in the gym, he just uh, we were talking about something. Then he went to the corner, opened his journal, and <laughs> wrote. 
after a while, I got used to that. <laughs> but um, yeah, this microprogression is uh, um, is vital. If you don't know how to do that, then you cannot accumulate and you cannot adapt the body to the higher resistance or higher challenge. So what, are, you, so what are your key principles to the microprogression? Use weightlifting as the example, which I'm sure is a metaphor for other forms of microprogression, but because there's recover, there's training, there's recovery, there's all of the different elements. Right. That, well, you know, I will talk to you uh, about this cerebral uh, palsy boy that I coach, right? And mm -hmm. I coached him for five years. Uh, when he came, he was completely dependent on parents, dressing and then clothing and then... Um, eating everything was, was done for him. So when he came, he couldn't lift 15 pounds bar, aluminum bar off the rack, right? That's how he was. He walked on toes and was uncoordinated and, and very weak and very sluggish. Okay. You don't have to know that he has cerebral palsy to really coach him. Mm. Most important is that you know that he is that way. Mm. So um, I set up the press and then found out that he cannot even take this 15 pounds bar. And I had always, uh, so I coached this uh, little kids, like five year old, and they were doing snatches and I made this wooden bar, three pounds bar. And it's really cool. My, my daughter was, you know, three years old. She was doing snatches. <laughs> three pounds bar. It looks so cute. <laughs> so, um, so I put that bar on the rack and asked him to lift. Then he left it. Okay. Then I added five pounds and it was eight pounds and he left it. Then I added 30, uh, another five pounds, 13 pounds. He left it. Then, uh, then I gave him back that... Uh, 15 pounds, and he lifted. Same lift, thing? Yeah, within like 10 minutes. Uh -huh. But he was lifted, he's like, one, right, that way. Right? So, but that is the beginning. That's the, how his strength was, right? And then from that day, I started, you know, organizing system for him, how much to lift every Every four, three, four days, he was coming twice a week. So I loaded a little bit, loaded a little. And the first time that I started loaded two pounds, you know, every time. And then three pounds and two pounds, it depends. And then, you know, in a year, he was a lot of stronger, right? Mm -hmm. But this micro progression, I, I set up according to months and years. The, after about three years, the micro progression were only one pound right, every week. But then last year was only a quarter pound. So he was stronger and stronger and stronger. But his uh, ability to adapt, right, to repeat and ad adapt was lower and lower, the mm. stronger he was. So that's why the microprogression changed according to that. So mm -hmm. uh, the last uh, uh, year, he was uh, only breaking records once a week and quarter pound. But when you think about the quarter pound, right, and you think about the year, uh, that brings a lot of pounds, right? Mm -hmm. It was 12 pounds, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you add, you know, two years, it's 24 pounds. But when you are at the end of your career, right, five pounds can be huge, right? right? So five pounds can be winning the championship or not. So he... Uh, he progressed throughout the five years from 15 pounds to 170 pounds. And he is a cerebral palsy boy who is 150 pounds. He is extremely weak and progresses from this to that. So if, you, uh, if I demanded from him too much, let's say, and then he wouldn't be able to lift or his recovery would be too long, that the microprogression would be violated. It means he would be too sore and he wouldn't be able to uh, accumulate and then adapt to that. He mm -hmm. would be backwards. So mm -hmm. that's the major mistakes with uh, coaching and training is that people put on themselves too much and they don't think weeks and, and months and years, mm -hmm. right? When you 
have micro progression, you think five years. Be five years is just a normal, uh, normal time to create something substantial and good in life. In any field, it's just you don't have five years. I don't even start. So I, 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 <laughs> I, I told the father, you know, you have five years, and I will, uh, you know, coach this boy, and I will make him independent in five years. You don't have five years, don't come here. And that's so. That's so important to hear because five years is something that in our culture people don't even understand. Like it doesn't like the amount the the idea that you would dedicate yourself to a plan for five years for a result. Let's say you want to lose weight, you want to lose weight immediately. If you want to get strong, you want to get strong immediately. You want to get rich, you want to get rich immediately. You want anything that you want. The expectation is that you're going to get it fast. But everybody who's a master always says the same thing, like patience, patience, patience like slow i <laughs> keep going but it's only five years really. <laughs> it's like, only five years it, it, it's you true. know look at the boy you know from completely dependent on parents you know going to uh, dressing and toilet and so on Co to complete independence he uh studies uh, he studied the last year math five hours a day he didn't have this energy at all right now he has it and then he passes eighth grade math and he's accepted to community college. From completely dependent human being to completely independence in five years. All right, this five years. Now, if I give him, you know, the parents $1 million now, but I would send the boy five years backward, they would never take the money, it's priceless. This five years mm -hmm. is priceless. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's only five years. But it's, you know, in five years, you can, you can deliver, you know, magic. But you have to have this five years. There was this uh, uh, Russian coach, and he said, I need 10 years to make a national champ. If I don't have it, I will destroy the one. Right? Yeah, because push you, you will push too fast. The microprogression is not going to work, and then adaptation is not going to work, and that destruction will happen. The Zen joke about this is this. The, the father uh, brought the, his son to the master to teach him happiness. So the master said, okay, so leave him here. I will talk to him. And then you can come in about an hour and we'll begin. So, okay, good. So he talks to the boy. And he tells him how he's going to do when and what. And, and he says, well, you know, if you do all of it in 10 years, you will know how to be happy. The boy says, but master, I'm a diligent student. I do always twice as much that, you know, uh, teachers ask me for. Wouldn't it be five years in this case? And the master says, well, in this case, it will be 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> That's well, it's a quite normal thing, right? <laughs> uh -huh. How would you apply that to something that's not physical, micro progression? How would you apply it? Because you're, you're a poet, you're a writer, you're a philosopher, you're a businessman, you've, you've done a lot of different things. How do you apply that principle of micro progression, or do you apply that principle of micro progression to other fields? If something is unknown, like uh, like poetry cannot measure really, and who can measure poetry? Other uh, poets, right? So you are in that uh, uh, in that energy. What are the poets are? They know what is poetry. They know. Uh, where it is and how it is, they it's in them. It's not like weightlifting, three hundred pounds world record. Everybody knows. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Transparency, hundred uh percent. -huh. When you are in poetry, you are in a contemporary world, the the world of poets, and uh, they sense it. Those who are you know teachers, they know where it is, and uh, this. Uh, you know, masters in a way can take you over as an apprentice and work with you or guide you or whatever it is. But there is also 
uh, progression of that, but it's seen only from the perspective of the teacher or the poet, mm -hmm. but not from the perspective of the one that is on a journey. Mm -hmm. You cannot see that. In weightlifting, you can see it. You know, if you lift 160 pounds, but 300 is the record, you know, you, know you have another it's... five years, right, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. get there. But in poetry, is uh, uh, is you are in complete, almost unknown. You have to uh, have the desire to to f to feel good about doing it, to to desire it, to to um, it, to somehow uh, know where uh, good writing is. You know, and then you know that uh, nobody can make you a poet, really. You know. People can work with you on improving your craft of writing, but nobody can make you a poet. Yeah. But there is a craft of writing of poetry. It just, but it's only craft of writing, right? Mm. So it's really, you know, hard to know where where it is. So which one of the different? It seems like if you're if you're talking micro progression for strength or weight loss or something along that the physical thing that you're trying to measure let's say i want to lose 50 pounds or i want to gain i want to you know improve my bench press 100 pounds or whatever that seems like that requires both patience and dedication like diligence all of these different things but if you're doing something that is an unknown unquantifiable like you said right. like poetry like what is that What's the difference there? That that requires just courage, trust. What what would you say? With you mean with poetry, with poetry or, or anything else, any any kind of art, any kind of thing that you're trying to offer, uh, could be an idea, could be a philosophy, could be a poem, could be a. Let's start with the something what is quantifiable. Yeah. Right. Let's say weight loss. Right. Okay. You have let's say uh, a person that is two hundred pounds, and. Uh, wants to be 150 pounds mm -hmm. and uh, so how many pounds uh, a week let's say the person could lose let's say a pound yeah make it simple right so 50 pounds now okay now you have 50 pounds to lose and this is a number transparency is 100 mm -hmm. number is there mm -hmm. and then okay you um going to go to um to get help, right? Because you don't know how to do it. Well, yeah, you go to a trainer or somebody, a wellness center, and, and that somebody puts you on a program and you follow the program and uh, didn't lose any pound, right? So uh, then that's not good. You go to another one and you lost 10 pounds, right? So in a week. So is that a little bit too fast? So that uh, can be controlled because you could be let's say, um, in flame, and then mm -hmm. now you drop the water and it can happen. But the progress has to happen, right? In micro-progression, the progress has to happen. So uh, let's say every week you have to lose one pound and it has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. and if it's not consistent, the skill of, of weight loss is not there. So mm -hmm. if you are erratic, you know that the teacher that is really teaching you really doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> so microprogression is uh, violated here, mm. right? So the skill is consistency. So weight loss is very, uh, it can be organized uh, to the T, right? Every week, exactly, you know, one pound for 50 weeks and, and you can deliver this uh, um, for one pound, right? And you know uh, the the funny thing sometimes yeah uh, I had clients women and then they had a period and they said but I'm on a period so you know it's like <laughs> I'm three pounds and say yeah you were on a period a month ago two months ago three months ago four <laughs> months ago right and here is the challenge that challenge that comes uh, now you have the numbers only right and the the numbers that you actually do what you need to do then delivery is there. But it's not so simple because then it's then is the brain and the mind, our lifestyle, the way we live. What is frustrated is for us to actually do what we need to do. 
So we are dealing with the self-control, self-discipline, liking things, disliking things, the whole unknown and the brain we are dealing now with. So that brain is 200 pounds, now then the brain needs to be 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. If not, let's say, if you take the person from 200 to 150 and that person, let's say they, you take the fat in one day out, right? And then, uh, but the person has the brain of 200 pounds. It means that whole lifestyle is connected to this 200 pounds. How much to eat, when to right. eat, where right. to go, what kind of food, and so on, right? So that is, uh, uh, if, you, if you don't um, change that, that the person will always go backward. So that's why any weight loss systems that do not address change of the mind will never succeed because people will go always backward. Seems like a great, <clears throat> a great case for micro progression in that it allows the brain time to adapt slowly. Yes, you know it's like when you, let's say I have I have three younger sisters, <clears throat> and I didn't really, I could I never could tell how much they were growing, you know, because I saw them every day, you know, and so they would get taller, and I know they were getting taller, but because I saw them every day, they were just my sisters. But then we would go see an aunt that we hadn't seen in six months and like oh my god you're so tall you know they would say that to the to the girls because it'd been a big gap you know like it happened fast for them because they hadn't seen it every day but it seems like with micro progression moving it slowly intentionally every and keeping it in mind that must help the brain adapt as well yes but you see when you do the when you coach somebody to the snatch right? So it's a different self-control demand than on the person who is losing weight. Mm. So let's say somebody comes uh, like uh, Tim Ferriss, right? He comes first time and he has flexibility problems or some uh, soreness problems. And then I designed a micro progression, how to take him from uh, the half squat to the deep squat, right? And and then I will inch by inch will take him down. If I don't do it, right, then it will create too much tightnesses and different pains and, and I, I will get stuck, always get stuck, right? But if I develop this micro progression, it means the repetitions and adaptation to that level and then move on, I'm able to get him from 20 inch squat you know, the, the 20 inches from the top to the, uh, from his, um, uh, bottom to the Ground. to the floor, right? To the six, seven inches. But it will take me a half a year or one year. But my brain is working how I watch him and what he's capable to do, right? That's micro progression in my brain. How far I I can go with him? So uh, let's say uh, I'm sensing his pain. I'm sensing his. Uh, progress, I'm sensing his anxiety, how he is going to go and how far. And I evaluate everything. I um, set up the progress and I watch. And I, as I watch, I see the progress is happening and adaptation happens. Good, right? So I move on and I'm adapting that on a weekly basis. And then when I get, let's say, to the full squat capabilities, then I, am, I will start moving into the dynamic moves, fast moves. But these are the moves, the micro progression has to be there as well. So very soft, nice jumps with receiving the bars gently and then progressively faster and faster and faster. But what controls all of it is time. How much time is needed for that? you know, to happen. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make it shorter, you will never make it, right? You'll go backward. You, you, you get tight, injured, or weaker, or exhausted, or, you know, worn out. Mm -hmm. So all of this are signs that microprogression is, you know, uh, violated. And then if, if you uh, have progress, everything works, and uh, the athlete is uh, recovered and uh, adapted, and we can move on, you are doing everything right. 
Yeah. But then you have the mind with weight loss. Weight loss is something else. It's, it's um, self-control is added to it. Mm. So we, we love food, we, we love lifestyle, and then it's really hard for us to eat a uh, certain amount of food. We control ourselves that way. That delivery that can be created because of it. So that is uh, a different um, element when it comes to microprogression because microprogression is in, in losing weight, but also microprogression is how we believe, how we think, how we relate ourselves to uh, the size of food, how we relate ourselves to sugar, how much sugar, let's say, uh, to you know the first month and the second month and so on until we achieve the, the time of not eating sugar, let's say, at all and, and base ourselves on eating all the produce. So it's everywhere microprogression. So, so it's a very complex, and what kind of exercise we are going to do, right? So mm. if you do uh, exercises that's uh, endurance exercises, those exercise w- exercises will burn the muscle and then will create the problem in the body that, you know, uh, uh, that we will crave more food, we'll get hungry, and then we'll lose ourselves to actually eat more. The weight loss is, you know, losing weight is, or staying a certain way is, uh, um, it, it, it bothered, you know, it's not bothered, but it's like it was, uh, uh, it was already difficult long time ago. Socrates, Socrates, you know, said, you know, said, Eat to live, live to eat, right? He pondered on that 2,500 years ago already, yeah? So he saw that there is something with it that we eat too much, right? (laughs) (laughs) Simply, we eat too much. (laughs) So when we eat too much, you know, we live to eat. There's something is wrong with us. Our brain is not working the right way. Uh, We become uh, this hungry beasts that, you know, we cannot control. So we only think these terms we cannot think uh, like people who eat to live. How do and you, they how do you, what do you tell that. people? What do you tell people who, who have that struggle, who are living to eat instead of eating to live? How do you coach them? How do you change their brain? And that's the microprogression. You, you, yeah, I sit with them once a week. We talk and talk and talk from different perspective, using different words, different scenarios, and uh, we... Yeah. Every time is different, so you know you. Every time you, kind of, uh, um, it's like a like a poet. Yeah, every time you focus on what happens, really. So, and what kind of a poem is in front of you? So here it is. You know, the person comes in, and what what really comes in, right? What the person brings, uh, because the frustrations are there, challenges are there. So, what kind of frustration is now? Like, you know, I had this. Um, my client came. He said, "I, uh, I'm really good five days, and then two days when I go home, I completely messed up. Right? <laughs> uh, I eat too much. I eat erratic. I eat the wrong thing, and so on, and so on. So, uh, okay, this is the challenge, right? It's not happening every day. It's after a year, this is the one, right? <laughs> and during that day." So um, then we talk more about this to open imagination, you know, to why this one is a problem and how to create a plan, a strategy to deal with it. And what is really the problem? So, um, you know, people who have priority problem, you know, so then um, the priority becomes um, not the weight loss, but the priority becomes the family. So the weight loss has to be the priority. Mm. So when you work for five days and you go home, the priority is not the family or your friends, because if they are, then you will lose what you need to do. Mm. You will lose what you know is important here and then progress of it. So uh, uh, when I talked to him, I said, you you cannot really abandon the the practice. Your practice is to follow what you need to do. And in spite of what your family wants, if you have to do the training, you do the training. If you have to lo- you eat 
this on the amount of food you eat. It's not like your family will be upset that you are eating, but if they upset, it's okay too. You just you have <laughs> to follow what you need to do. If you uh, practice TM, if you have meditation at 5 p.m., you go, you meditate. You, you don't go and don't meditate because your friends say, oh, let's go here and there, right? You say, yeah. yeah, yeah, I will go. I will catch up with you, but I need to meditate. Yeah, you meditate. It's a, it's a, uh, there have to be strong principles in the human brain. Develop uh, what is first, what is second. Prioritizations are important. And I had this prioritization in Poland that I had a, my bar, the so weightlifting bar, was number one. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so there was my mother, and my mother was the second, right? So, <laughs> and then, then were my friends, and there was my girlfriend. My girlfriend was, and Anila was upset all the time about that. <laughs> But that's how it was, right? Of course, Anila moved ahead on the... Yeah, she bumped up a little yeah, bit. bumped up, right? We married and so on. Yeah. But, you know, I... She, made, not, it, she made it right underneath the bar. It's she not, never quite beat the bar. Yeah. It's not that the bar is more important than my mother, <laughs> but it is important that I need to do certain things in the day. Yeah, that's right? your priority. And that's so I don't lose it, right? And then that gives me, you know, uh, my own improvement, progress, microprogression, life, and so on. So without that, I, what I would be, I would collapse. I wouldn't have any, any tangible plan and strategy to actually make myself better. I would be lost, Yeah. right? Because I would do whatever uh, friends want me to do. I would do whatever my girlfriend wants me to do and would lose my really priority and my base uh, 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 base things that are extremely important to me. Okay, so you write down your your list of priorities, right. like what your priorities are. I think you did a great job explaining that. So you have this list of priorities, but you still aren't doing it. So let's say, like, I have a friend in mine who I guarantee her top of her list of priorities would be to write. She really wants to be a writer. I have another friend who top of her list of priorities is to sing. She really wants to be a singer. Right. But if so if they if they're honest, which I believe they would be, they would put that as the number 1. But, you know, and then maybe number 4 would be hanging out with friends, you know, going to parties, maybe even lower on that. Right. But nonetheless, if you actually look at their life, at their lifestyle, parties take number 1. Priority. Well, you know what happens with the parties. Let's say you are in college, right? Yeah. And then parties are number one. You expel after a while, you're gone. You are not <laughs> really finishing the college. It's very simple in life. <laughs> in, in, it's like, uh, you know, in certain places, you know, it's like we talk about the comfort zone, right? You have the comfort of to sing or not to sing, and, you know, it really doesn't matter for you. Then, you know, uh, okay. But for people that, you know, uh, singing is life is something bigger than uh, money, success, fame. You know, like poetry for me is that way. I mm. write poetry; it's, it's bigger than almost anything, right? So it's like uh, it, it, it doesn't matter uh, whether I am famous or that poetry will be published or not published or will right. be read by anybody or not. Really, it doesn't matter. I'm a poet. I write my poetry, <laughs> and and that's it. You know, I'm I'm not but going to go. Some people and aren't you. Some people aren't you. Good. Well, Jersey. you know, it's not a me. It's like uh, you know, uh, when you love something, right? You do. That's. But your, what if you're scared? Your... What if you're scared? What if someone, let's say, it's a. But what if they're scared of writing their poetry and sharing their poetry because they're identified with being a poet and they're scared of doing it? Or this person's scared of writing their book because they're. People, sure. people get afraid yeah. of these you things. You understand? That I get these people, but you find mentors. Mm. Then you find other people that help you actually with the priority. You know, you when you find them, that you see how they live, and then when you see how they live, it's the you know uh, mimicking. This is the mimicking, like uh, you know, um, Stoics that the, the mm. teachings were was mimicking, was not knowledge passing, was mimicking to be. Because to be Stoic doesn't mean to know what Stoic is. So today a lot of professors know 
right? What is Stoicism? But they are not Stoics. So <laughs> it's really, you cannot teach that Stoicism, yeah. really, right? You have to be you it can to teach, teach it. Uh, knowledge about Stoicism, but you cannot teach how to be Stoic. In order to teach that, you have to be. Well, you know, today we have these ideas of, uh, you know, depressed psychologists, you know, uh, having clients that they are depressed, right? So um, kind of weird things happen right, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, but mimicking, you know, is the, if you want to learn something, if you want to, uh, you know, to um, not only learn, but you become, you know, poetry, let's say, you have to surround yourself with poets you have to be around them you have to live and breathe that way so uh yeah i remember when i was uh applied to vermont college and my poetry was rejected so next day i called and i said well i would like to talk to somebody who rejected me and uh, the woman said you cannot you know call somebody because it's the decisions of people and so on, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, listen, you don't understand me. I am this kind of a person. I want to work on my poetry. So I know I know I will work on my poetry and next year I will apply. And then if you reject me the following year, I will apply again. I will work these years to make the poetry <laughs> the right way. The problem I have I don't know what's wrong with it. <laughs> and, and I need a, an advice. I need guidance. Yeah, yeah. you said about it. Uh -huh. So next day, Roger Weingarten, the, the head of the department, you know, called me. And he talked to me about my poetry. And then, then he, he suggested that I contact, you know, uh, uh, some people in L.A. Uh, that could help me. And then I... Contacted, right? I contacted Ralph Angel. It was my really great friend, really. We became friends, you know, for life. And unfortunately, he passed two days ago. It was so, uh, what a loss we have, you know? Yeah. Hmm. That's like you lose somebody like that. And then, you know, like you have this something inside you that can never be filled. Back. Sure. So um spent uh, with Ralph a lot of time. And there was this uh, a professor at, um, at uh, USC, David St. John's, and talked to him. And the, these people helped me to uh, find poets, find being around them. And so it, then, it seems like it seems like the step of finding the mentor and surrounding yourself with people who are being what you're trying to be is essential because yes. that's that's an essential thing if you really want something and you really are honest with yourself about what you want you have to take the step to either be coached or be surrounded by people who are that you can mimic yes but you know they have to be great Right, they yeah. they have to be masters of uh, of the thing. That they have to be people that, uh, like Stoics. They are Stoics, right? So they are not people who know about Stoicism. If you want to really become Stoic, you know, find the one that is a Stoic and then is also a teacher and and start there. When you start there, then then you will start with something, you know, beautiful. Something in front of you will be what you really want to be. So you will be in 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 front of um, something that is real. Mm. And when when you are in front of something that you feel, you sense, you are always comfortable around that. Even though it's very challenging, and on on daily, weekly basis, and monthly basis, it's challenging. But it is micro progressive challenging. That's why it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you. The, the the master will or you know the one that is will always make uh, your uncomfortable comfortable. So whatever you are, right? You know, like uh, people come to my place and they are extremely uncomfortable with their bodies and and with uh, um, with their frustrations and and you know in incapabilities and. 
uh, with uh, instant gratification and they don't have this delay gratification, but it can be developed. It, it can be created through time, right? And then when it's passed the right way by the master, that is embraced by the person and the person is okay with five years. Mm -hmm. And the person is okay with two years or five years or 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I uh, found, um, um, because, you know, Ralph couldn't work with me, with my poetry. And then, uh, and then Davidson Jones uh, suggested Beyond Barak in, in LA. We, we, uh, we became the part of the poets and groups and writing. And then uh, I found um, Peter Levitt, and Peter Levitt was doing the, uh, at that time, um, groups, teaching groups, poetry groups, and I joined the, the group. But the first day when I went to him, uh, he, he took these hundred poems, my poems that I sent to Vermont College, right? And he looked what, about one second <coughs> on the, the first page. In the middle, about one second, at the end, maybe half a second, drop everything to the ground, it's all garbage. <laughs> <laughs> that was my 10 years of writing. Yeah. So, and he was sitting, looking at me, right? So, and I was sitting, I was just thinking, and I was just thinking how the person can look at my <laughs> 10 years of writing and say it's all garbage, it's only like three seconds, right? <laughs> Couldn't place this in my brain. <laughs> but you know, I was lucky because at that time I coached my Olympic weightlifting team at the UCLA. And, uh, and then one uh, Paul, Paul Volter was sent from Colorado University uh, with a letter. Uh, from his coach, and he was asking me to take over him uh, and help him with pole vaulting, coaching him using Olympic weightlifting. So he came to me, and I took the letter, read the letter, right? And I told him to go and do the snatch. So he took the bar, and he did the snatch. I said, that's enough. And then he said, I can do, that's enough, right? So one second, I needed one second to mm. know everything yeah. about him. You know, what kind of lifting he did, how much he can do, in what style, and what he needs to do, how many years he needs to, you know, to spend in order to go to the certain place. And all this, I was really lucky because that happened and Peter was looking at me, right? <laughs> and... and and then, you know, he saw that I have this inside my brain, you know, dialogue. And then he said, it's going to be like this. In five years, maybe you will write a stanza. In 10, maybe a poem. In 15, you will know about writing. In 20, maybe you will be a poet. Life will show up. <laughs> And then he was staring at me and said, so, do you want to start? I said, sure. <laughs> 20 years will pass. I want to find out if I am a poet. <laughs> right? and, and, you know, it's really funny about uh, that because uh, it was 94, right? So it's already about 25 years. Tw and I was the mark was coming, the 20 years, yeah? and I had some books published and so on. And I really figured out really during this time, the 20 years, that what is really poetry, right? This poetry is not to be published or not to be published, to be famous and not. Poetry is something that it happens when it happens. This is that uh, when it happens, you know, and you have to love it, like, you know, songwriting uh, or song singing or, or you know, uh, playing piano. Or lifting weights, you know, I have these two loves, you know, because I love Olympic weightlifting and I love poetry. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, when you know, you know, it's, it's like when it flows and 
and it happens to you, then, then you crave it. A lot of people who have these passions, like you have obviously weightlifting, poetry, we feel like, ah, uh, I can't do that because I can't make a living. I can't make money doing those things. A lot of people probably, even if those two things in particular, weightlifting and poetry, yeah, it's, right. not, it's not the easiest way to make money. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter said, you know, I, you know, poetry is like, uh, you know, twin the lines is very fast, you know, very powerful, uh, you know, writing, yeah. And um, and he said, well, you're attracted to poetry because you snatch, you know, snatch is like <laughs> intense and powerful. Yeah, you're right. You know, I I was, um, uh, it was eighty. 87 when I came here and I uh, went to see the president of American Wildering Association, Bob Heiss. Uh, he was was a three generations of uh, weightlifters, beautiful people in Eagle Rock. And, and, and I talked to him about what to do. And he said, well, you know, coaches that they come from Bulgaria and Russia and Poland, you know, they they don't teach weightlifting because there's no money in it. So C said, you know what they do? Usually they open the the car shops and fix cars because they are usually good with engineering or something like right. that. And I said, Bob, I don't want to fix cars. <laughs> and and then, so he said, well, you know, maybe you will uh, then... Um, like something new that is coming in, but some coaches don't like it because uh, it's working with regular people is not really the same as working with athletes and some coaches don't like it, but you can go and, you know, check it if you do. And so what is it? And he said, oh, it's called personal trainer, right? Mm -hmm. So it was 87. So then, then I found a place and then I um, found a place in Burbank uh, power source and talk to the owner and so on and then I um, I was exposed to uh, to these regular people right and uh, writing them programs and 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 figuring out what to do and how and and I really loved that yeah I don't know why I loved that maybe because I was the fireman or whatever before but uh, the making money is um, I couldn't make money to teach people how to snatch. <laughs> With poetry, it's the same way. You know, people, uh, uh, usually poets are teachers, mm -hmm. you know, like creative mm -hmm. writing teachers. And mm -hmm. that's how they make money in the poetry writing. No matter how great the poets are, it's very difficult to live out of poetry. So poetry right. is love. Olympic weightlifting is love. It's, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, you do it because you love to do it. It just happens that there is no money. Yeah. You know, <laughs> some other people love acting and there is a lot of money there, right? <laughs> but it's really in life is uh, not important. Yeah. Well, it's really not important. What matters is you're doing what you love. Was yeah, it, it really matters. It really matters that. Uh, and it, if it happens that uh, it is something that is cannot support you, that's okay. Then you find something very close to it and you do it. At least like, you know, the the poet, poets that teach creative writing or Olympic weightlifters, then they go and now to teach uh, CrossFit or they, they had teams and teach, you know, Olympic weightlifting teams, yeah? So it's a, a you always find a way how to support yourself, but uh, you cannot make out of it a big deal. Mm. You know, the more important is that you stay what you love and uh, perf keep perfecting it, perfecting and perfecting throughout the life. And it, it's, it evolves and adapts, you know, poetry, of course, getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Olympic weightlifting, you, you kind of lose the power when you age. It doesn't happen in the poetry. Uh, but it, sure. it it happens with Olympic weightlifting, so you, it adapts to the you adapt to the age and you adapt to what you can do. But it's it's the same problem, uh, no matter what, whether you are twenty year old or fifteen year old or sixty years old, right, or mm. sixty five as I am today, right? It's a it's a different uh, adaptation, different different fight, but it's a 
constant fight. You, you're a fighter. You know, you're, being a poet is not an easy task. Being a poet is, uh, is dealing constantly with extremely difficult um, diversity, unfortunate people. And you write about that. So it's it's you write about something how to love uh, you know how to love something that is needing help right how to find yourself in situations where people um, suffer and you share the suffering so it's a um, it's not a it's not a glory but there is not a glory you know so and. Sometimes, you know, happens in paintings that the painters kind of uh, you know, go with um, painting something for people and, and sometimes they make that money right that way. But most point, painters really cannot make a living. Most, right? You know, Picasso could make it somehow mm -hmm. because he just did some, you know, uh, portraits as well. We had this really great, uh, friends, uh, painters, usually they paint portraits, or, but it's not really painting. It's not really art. You know, That's this like is, being the teacher or the personal fitness coach. Right, right? Yeah. yes. Yeah, Something it's, it's, close, but not exactly the thing that they love the most. Yeah, when, when, when the art really happens is, is you, uh, you don't write a poem because somebody asks you for it. You know, the, it, there's no such thing. So, that's the divides any kind of art from something that somebody pays for, right? Yeah. That's why the situation is with kind of movies and thinking that you are artist or not, right? So uh, if you if you are paid, then then you start really creating some kind of uh, art or whatever it is because somebody paid you, and that can change the the piece of art mm -hmm. or not creating art at all. Right, yeah. because of that i really so i know this is reiterative for people listening but i'm just going to say before we move on because i want to talk about what we were talking about earlier because i really enjoyed that thread of conversation but <clears throat> one thing i'm going to do as soon as this podcast ends is i'm going to write my list of priorities i'm going to write my list of priorities down and i'm going to really be honest with what i i think in this for me i'm going to be honest with what i want my list of priorities to be and then I'm going to really look at my life and see what my list of priorities actually are, like what I'm actually doing, because I think there's going to be a difference. And I'm and I'm pretty good, you know. I've accomplished a lot of things, and I'm I'm pretty good at at tracking this. But even with myself, I know that the list of priorities that I want and the list of priorities of how, what I'm actually doing, they're going to be different. And then I'm going to have to look at those, and I'm going to I'm excited to look at those and and ask the question why. Yeah, it's amazing. Thing. Why? Why are my why are the priorities that I want for my life different than the priorities that I'm actually acting? Why? And just get really curious and just keep asking why for as many fucking days as it takes to figure out what the reason is. Because otherwise, those two lists of what you want your priorities to be and what you know your priorities actually are, those should be the same. Yeah, well, and when it happens, you just think about you know like uh, vegetarian. Right, if you're a vegetarian, you're a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Nobody will corrupt you, right? To eat, you know, meat. Right. Mm -hmm. You're a vegetarian. <laughs> that's it. So that's that's how you need to see yourself uh, in life. If you are Olympic weightlifter, you're Olympic weightlifter. Nobody can take you away from <laughs> that. Right. It's, but it, it's easier to collapse, let's say, if you're losing weight, yeah? Uh, it's easier to collapse, be corrupted by others than when you are a pianist, right? And then you play piano. So when you are losing weight, it's, uh, it's not as priority rooted as uh, it is when you are a pianist or you are a poet. It would be just writing no matter what. So you have to create this something that is extremely important for you, like uh, weight loss for some people, that that has to be priority, like being a pianist or be a vegetarian. That way. That's the only way that you actually can uh, achieve and deliver and have results. Otherwise, 
the priority will shift. Will it will shift? It means that something else will become more important, and something else can be important, like a party. Yeah? Oh, the party! Let's go and then have a party. I was I, I was in the situation when I was <laughs> young, and my uh, friends they say, "Hey, let's go to the party." And I went to the party, and the party was until 2 a.m. We were drinking and so on. Next day, I went to the gym. Couldn't lift, <laughs> right? I was like, you know, Micro 5% down. Regression. Yeah, yeah, I was down, right? <laughs> yeah. I said, no parties, man. <laughs> I, 10 a.m., I am in bed. Yeah. Not going anywhere. Unless it is Friday, right? And Saturday, I will not train or Saturday through Sunday. And that can only the day I can go. And that is priority. I, I because you what has to rule has to rule something extremely important for you and has to rule everything else. So let's say I have to train, I have to progress, I have to achieve, and then because of that, I will go uh, have fun with my friends on Saturday because Sunday I can sleep, right? That's the only day I will, and that's it. Mm. Whether my friends like it or not, Yeah. right? Because that I can I can tell them very fast of yourself, right? Yeah, that's yeah, it. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So uh, that's how uh, that's how you really be have to be uh, uh, strong and imaginative in what is really the priority. So don't pick up too many of those things because if you do, then you know you're not. And, and also succeed. understand why you're setting those priorities because you have to set those priorities. It seems like love is the strongest motivation. You loved you loved your weightlifting. You loved right. your poetry. Like if your if your weight loss is because oh you want your it's not it's not something that you would you love your body and you you love you would love to have your body be able to do different things. Maybe you want to run or play with your kids or you want to do something more. You want to would you say that, you know, but that's a really great love. You yeah. Know? Would that's you say that we, setting we, your priorities based upon love is the most powerful motivating force? Yes, of course. And then, you know, uh, I open imagination to people because when they want to lose weight, they want to lose weight because they want to be healthy, right? They want to be around for the grandchildren, right? They want to uh, live for other people. And that has to be uh, expanded in the imagination. Mm -hmm. When you more expand, expand, becomes more and more important and becomes actually uh, so important that actually the people can do uh, what they need to do and they don't have a problem with. The other thing is you expand the love of less, right? What is enough, what is right. So we expand that too. So, you know, there are not only that talk about you, that talk about that more i don't understand that you expand what's less you mean you talk about you talk about what would be what you don't like what you would dislike the no 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 well you know let's say you you like to eat a big plate of food right but you can also uh, fall in love with eating half of the plate of food and then you can take the transition there and then you become that way so mm. So the, you retrain, are, you train yourself to love something different, or love less, right? Or love less. Which so is you different. can you can look at yourself that actually uh, the big plate of food is too much for you, and and then can create some problems. Okay, what kind of problems now that can create? Yeah. So if somebody really cares for living long, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. So living long depends on very clear the research points that on CR calorie restriction and free radicals. So these are the, the two ways, approaches that actually uh, help us to live long. The research on monkeys and rats and so on sure. shows that they can live 40, 50% longer if, the, the restric if there is restrictions of calories. It means they have certain body weight and they don't gain weight. All right, that's really important here and that's the, that's the way. So when you expose this to people and say, well, you are 200 pounds, but you 200 pounds, you are already in danger of certain illnesses and you can, you know, you can die. But if you're 150 pounds, 
you actually are like this, you know, uh, monkeys that you can live for to present more. If you care for that, it can be really strong. Uh, motivation. Yes, motivation, inspiration to actually make it happen. The other thing it could be very spiritual, right? So it can be spiritual to the uh, to the uh, to the person that uh, excess is uh, is not good, right? If the person in front of you or me is that kind of a spiritual person, that excess is not good, and the person is two hundred pounds, then I talk more about what is excess, where actually we use too much, and when we eat too much then that is actually uh, not, not good for the planet, not good for anybody, mm. and so on. It means that you have, to, in order to keep this 200 pounds, you have to waste. You have to waste a certain amount of food that actually you don't need at all, right? So in, in a way, you live the life of excess. It's not good, right? Mm. So that person can really comprehend that. It can get into the person's, mind and that person will say you know what yeah I, I see it now right that's not good and that powerful uh statement right there can be uh leading to overcoming any frustration any uh discomfort anything about the food and that person will get 250 pounds and be there right because that that's how powerful that thing is mm. some people really don't like waste at all right but they don't know that they are 200 pounds and they waste so i show them okay if you're 200 pounds you have to eat three times more food than you eat it means that you spend three thousand dollars not one thousand dollars you can save two thousand dollars if you eat enough right so if somebody is you know silicon valley person and is a data-oriented human being it's very clear for that person to uh, to say, oh, yeah, I, I got it. So wh why I was eating 200 uh, for that 200 pounds? Well, it's just a habit. You didn't know that you were supposed to be 150 pounds. You didn't know that this is your your best. So you, you became 200 pounds and nobody told you that you were supposed to be 150, right? So when you actually know, then... That knowing that 150 pounds rules your life and rules everything around. It's so powerful. So like for me, it's 140 pounds, right? So in the Happy Body book, we, I aligned, I removed completely vagueness out of the fitness. So transparency is 100%. It means I have a number. I have 140 pounds number, right? So I live that number. And that is a powerful number because that, that number helps me to be 140 pounds. If I didn't know that number, then then I could be 180 or 170 or remember 110, right? Why not to be either way? So, uh, but since I know the number, then I deal with my frustrations, then I deal with my self-control, then I deal with, uh, with becoming a better person when I actually, you know, be able to make it happen. I eat only what's enough for that 140 mm. pounds and no more. And since, since you eat only what's enough, it's enough is, is really interesting because when you eat enough, you never waste. You eat everything on the plate. Mm. We, we do not waste. You know, when I put people on the happy body program, then don't waste at all because they eat only enough. And it's always like some kind of not enough. And that is the, uh, the Japanese way of living. Uh, it's called hibachi. Or, Ikigai. Is that right? I don't know the name. I don't remember. But they eat only when they're 80% full. Mm. But that is eating just enough, right? When you eat that, that way, they eat everything what is on your plate. But when you don't know about this, you don't eat everything what is on the plate. You waste a lot. You waste by preparing, you waste by not eating everything. So you create a lot of waste. Mm. One of the things that, you know who Tony Robbins is? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that he has people do is he also has people 
live the opposite reality, the contrast, you know? So he explores like what happens. So let's say someone is a hundred pounds overweight and he has them, he will have them go through just as an example, he'll have them go through the life and what the life means and what that's going to do to the body over time. What that's going to do yeah. the imagination. He, he paints the imagination. He paints the imagination of yes. the negative side right. as well as painting the imagination of the positive side. Do you think that that's productive? Yes, very productive because you know you open uh, for the person imagination and consequences, mm. consequences of good, consequences of bad, and you open both, and it can be very uh, motivational. I, I had this teacher one I remember. And and she was an alcoholic, and she was uh, she was still a teacher, and she was drinking. And at one session, I painted her whole future, and almost day, week by week, micro progression. What will happen? I said, I told her, today you are drinking, and your principal doesn't know yet. But you will keep drinking. And one day he will look at you and he will see something. He will be puzzled by something. right? But you will hide well because you are hiding well. You're drinking. So, uh, so he will talk to you because he will be uh, puzzled by that. And then uh, you will go away with it. And then one day will come that uh, uh, the principal will look at you and will see something uh, that... Uh, again, that's what he saw, and he would think that well, it, it, it's something is off with you. Something you are tired mm. or exhausted. Or something he would be looking for. Uh, why you are the way you are? You will become a little bit sloppy, and then you will forget things. Maybe you will be aggressive, and this is going to happen. Eventually, he will find out what's going on, and then he will face you, and he will talk to you, and then uh, of course you will say, ah, well, you know. Yeah, I understand, and so on. You will promise that you will be not drinking, and so on. And of course, you will be br- drinking, right? You know, mm. Let's say maybe you you flip, but let's say you keep drinking and you don't care. Then eventually, you will be fired. And when you are fired, you you go to your family. You have two children. You have your husband, and then you you are at home. You are drinking. You have two kids, right? And then it will go slowly that interaction between you. Your husband, he will be pushing for you to go to recovery, to uh, to help yourself. And then, uh, if you don't do that, that you will be very frustrating interaction between both of you. It will end up probably in the divorce, and in divorce you will lose your children because you mm. will not have your children because you are an alcoholic. You are irresponsible. You don't have the job, and then you will end up in a somewhere apartment, one room alone. With, without nobody. Mm. That's how it's going to be. And that from that probably will go into the, the stronger drugs and, and maybe on the street. Yeah. And you end lo- alive there. Well, this is it in front of you. It can maybe take two years or five years, but it will go that direction. Yeah, so it's either progression or regression. And you paint both with your imagination to see right. the reality that could be each, and then that, if that you, becomes the if motivation. You, yes, if you now really stop, really, and and stop drinking. So I I I told her first, let's set up on a one drink a day, only one glass, no more, no two or three and four or no the whole bottle. Let's just fight with that, fight with one thing, right? One drink. And so she was fighting with this one drink for a month or two. Very frustrating, but she was fighting with it. Then I said, okay, now we have to drink every other day, Monday, Friday, Tuesday, no drinking, right? And then months again with this, frustrations and so on. And then I said, okay, Monday, Friday, no drinking. You drink Friday, Saturday, only these two, and only one drink. One drink is enough. So that I wrote, I wrote this poem about one drink because it's uh, the 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 one drink is very powerful thing. You know, I always tell people, listen, this is what happens to me when I go to a dinner. When I have a dinner, then I have a drink, 
And then when I drink one, it's good. I feel good, happy, and everything is fine. Then I have another. When I have another, then uh, I'm, you know, like have a little bit of anxiety. Uh, I'm uh, more anxious and I talk louder, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so on. When I have third, I have to say that I was sorry next day because <laughs> I did, I messed up. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so he came out with the idea to drink one drink at a dinner or wherever you are. So, uh, when I go to a restaurant, I have uh, always um, uh, vodka with uh, fresh lime, squeeze uh, lime or lemon. And I will drink a little bit and I have a sparkling water and I fill up the glass. I keep filling up the glass and drinking. That goes slowly into me and with micro progression in a way, right? And then after about an hour or hour, one and a half, I just have only sparking water. But that's good. I, I'm okay with that. And I, it's my setup. Mm -hmm. So then um, that prevents me because the glass is full from the waiter who comes in and say, do you want another one? Right? But that's inviting to, to the danger zone. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't happen. So um, that's my strategy to, for you know, one one drink. I have another strategy with the apples. When I eat apples, I can eat 10 or 20 apples. I just love apples, <laughs> right? But you know, enough is enough, right? Yeah. So it's there is a, such a thing to know what is enough. And I know because I am 140 pounds, so I know that I can gain a lot of weight on apples. <laughs> <laughs> so when I drive a car, I say, okay, it's 30 minutes, and I'm going to eat this apple. And I will finish the apple when I arrive. And that sets up my brain to uh, some to, so to achieve something because I'm really strong achiever. So I have to achieve, and I can achieve, you know, eating ten apples, right, twenty apples in this thirty minutes. But I also achieve eating one apple in thirty <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so it's very important to set up your know, uh, kind of you know, what you're going to do uh, with uh, perspective to something, what is intelligent and what is uh, mathematical in numbers and why is it that way? And that can help then. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think what you're saying too is a lot of times I think people try to go from drinking to zero drinks ever. I'm never drinking again. Oh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. It's tough to go there because there's no there's no progression, there's no plan. And then if you have if you say I'm going to have no drinks, and then you have that first drink, but that's not part of the plan. And it's like, well, I'm already off the plan anyways. Might as well have all the drinks. And then you start you, you lose yeah. you lose trust in yourself. But this the you micro progression. You lose the faith in yourself. Yeah. If you break that, but if you have a progression that you can hold to, right? And like that's just enough. You have just an, you have just the right amount of discipline to hold to that then it seems like that's going to create the habit change that you're really looking for. Well, that's, that's the whole, um, you know, the journey that the brain comes from 200 pounds to 150 and love 150. Because it's easy to become 150 pounds. But if, if the brain is not shifting toward 150, it will take you back. Uh, as soon as you are 150, the brain's, hey, hey, let's go and have party, let's go and eat, let's go to eat this, forget about this, this, uh, this diet that you are doing now. You are 150, you can't do now things, right? <laughs> uh, you, we can go, okay, we go, right? And then suddenly you're 160, 170, 180, 190, 210, right? And then you wake up. So um, it's over and over, that same thing happens over and over. Why? Because the 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 brain is not developed in the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe brain is more on the delay gratification, self control, you know, the hard choices and so on. The midbrain in the middle is on instant gratification. So teaching people instant is now. I want now, and that's it, right? So um, there was this study in um, 
at Stanford about with kids that were four years old and marshmallows. Marshmallows, them, right? Yeah. So you know, uh, some of them they resisted, some of them they didn't. When they revisited these kids, uh, you know, twenty five years after. Those who could resist, they had the delay gratification already genetically, right? So they uh, they had a good life, organized life. They usually had a uh, college degree and you know you know financial uh, stability. They had everything good. Usually married, children. Others had problems, right? So. Um, so the development of this delay gratification is extremely important in life. I mean, it it comes with this uh, this micro progression because becoming a good person in life is aligned with it. That's why maybe people are so attracted to stoicism and stoics because stoics are really the idea is to be a good person, a virtuous person. But that's the uh, Development of delay gratification, mm. development of self-control, development what is good, what is right, and it's a very progressive uh, journey toward becoming a good person. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I think this has given me a lot of tools to uh, even myself, you know, to both for coaching and both for my own life, and both uh, hopefully for everybody listening. So. It's clear that you've not only developed mastery as a as a weightlifter and as a poet, but also as a coach, because uh, that's coming that's coming through really clear in this podcast. And uh, it's a real it was a real pleasure to have you, man. Well, thank you. It was really fantastic, and you know, I hope that you know people get you know something out of it that they will be able to implement some. You know, we don't know how the words work really and uh, how we talk right but the you know the thing with words is that the right words to the right person in the right time is magic mm. and it happens that's why i love to talk to people because i never know what work you know like one day this this client came and and she was really doing very well right and the two years passed, and and I said, "Wow, you know, you do everything what I said, and 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 everything is working. Uh, how did it happen? I didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you told me, and I said, "What did I tell you?" I, she said, <laughs> "She said, two years will pass." I said, "I said that, and then yeah, and then." That that was it. He said, "Yeah, that that worked with me. And that motivated, inspired me to everything what was needed to do." How would you know? Right? Nobody knows. <laughs> That's why it's so important that we talk a lot mm -hmm. and keep talking because you know uh, some people after this podcast will like three words from here, but others five words from there. Others, they will just two words there. But we don't know which mm. one and to whom. Mm. That's why, you know, thank you for, you know, inviting me. Yeah, Absolutely. It was a pleasure to yeah. share. Yeah, likewise. Myself. <laughs> likewise. All right, so you have a book, The Happy Body. Um, people can get that book, I'm sure. And where else? Where else can people find more of your teachings and more of maybe your poetry or anything else? Where can people learn more, read more, experience more? Well, the, the books are on Amazon, so people can get there. Um, uh, reading is uh, reading is a fantastic thing. I, I think that's good that we have we have books. Mm -hmm. Cannot imagine my life with without books. Books are everywhere in my home yeah. in meditation room in the gym <laughs> in in the kitchen and in in the living room yeah. right books are uh, precious so you know having uh having books is uh, is a great thing uh, i i remember Thich Nhat Hanh and then you know i was ordained by him uh, as a buddhist and then um i read every book of his 
mm. wherever wherever books knew and it was I was inhaling these books like you know uh, good food it's just all the words beautiful words really it's just like you're reading and it's just going into you and it feels so good it feels so good mm. and, ah books well I, I hope that you know my books will create some of it <laughs> yeah no <laughs> doubt people. I'm sure they will and I'm sure this podcast will as well all right. Well, thank, thank you, you much, my friend. Pleasure. All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. All right. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to AubreyMarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.